now let's move on to a slightly different uh, class of reactions which is to go to look at uh, the wittig reaction so some of you may have already studied this the wittig reaction is a very famous reaction for forming carbon carbon double bonds so the mechanism of the wittig reaction or the reagents are i react a ketone here with this kind of a compound so this is nothing but a carbon attached to p ph 3 and since phosphorus has uh, four bonds it has a positive charge and you can actually deprotonate this next to this carbon and this is known as a, a ylid and the ylids are generated by reacting you know for example an alkyl bromide with triphenylphosphine and you will get a triphenylphosphonium type of species here and then you add a base and you get this ylid so this ylid is a very good nucleophile so the ylid can then attack the carbonyl and give you this product before we go into the details of the mechanism what we need to understand here is there's a bond between this carbon and this carbon and the c double bond o is gone there is no carbonyl as shown here and there's now a double bond between these two carbons and the product here is uh, triphenylphosphine oxide so like i mentioned this is the ylid form and it's fairly stable it can also you know you can draw a resonance form of the phosphorine here looking at the mechanism so i already mentioned to you how this ylid can be produced so once this ylid is formed the minus attacks the aldehyde or a ketone and then you generate this o minus and now comes the interesting part of the reaction of the or the elimination of the of this product so the o minus here finds the right geometry wherein the oxygen and uh, phosphorus are actually in the same plane so the phosphorus carbon carbon oxygen they are all in the same plane okay and then this produces a favorable situation where you can form an intermediate like this and subsequently you can push arrows to produce the double bond as well as the triphenylphosphine oxide now you can think about you know the geometry of this compound in various ways and so if the elimination were to occur where the oxygen and phosphorus are anti periplanar to each other you would get a product with a different geometry if the oxygen and phosphorus are in a syn periplanar that is like i showed here they are in the same plane then the geometry of the product is going to be different so through various reaction mechanisms characterizing the reaction the products of a reaction it has been established that the geometry that is adopted is actually syn peri planar so i will write it down here syn peri planar so keep in mind we have looked at e2 elimination reactions and there we have proposed a anti peri planar conformation for elimination whereas in wittig reaction it's actually a syn peri planar conformation moving on to the next olefination reaction this is called the julia olefination reaction so we have looked at you know the two categories of active methylene compounds the first one we saw was the nitro compound so the alpha position to a nitro compound is quite acidic we have also looked at cyano compounds and cyano also is quite electron withdrawing in nature and therefore the alpha position to cyano is also quite acidic the last compound that we are going to look at is the sulfone so the sulfone is also fairly electron withdrawing because you know you can imagine that this can be delocalized in the following manner so this alpha position to a sulfone is also quite acidic so therefore if you see the reaction here what we are doing is we are taking this compound which is the sulfone and then reacting it with uh, n butyl lithium followed by reaction with an aldehyde now when you see this reaction you find that there is no a carbon carbon bond that is formed the carbon carbon bond that is formed is formed between this carbon and 
this carbon. Okay, and this is basically a straightforward addition to a carbonyl compound of a carbon-based nucleophile. The only difference in Julia olefination is that there is a couple of more steps where you have the alkylation reaction that happens on this oxygen followed by reaction with uh, sodium amalgam and ethanol. And these are just special conditions under which olefin can be formed. And so we need to understand the mechanism of this process. So like I mentioned, the first reaction here is the reaction of n-butyl lithium and you produce this enolate here. And then the enolate can attack the aldehyde and produce this kind of an intermediate. And now this O- is actually quite a good nucleophile. So if you react it with a alkyl halide, you produce this kind of an intermediate. Now we need to understand a little bit about this metal based reactions. So as you know, sodium can form Na plus and E minus. And so this obviously sodium is uh, super reactive. And so therefore we need to do it in a very controlled manner. So mercury is used. So when you use sodium and mercury, what happens is that it is a very good source of an electron. So this electron adds to this carbon uh, sulfur bond and uh, you know it results in the cleavage of this carbon sulfur bond and SO2 minus leaves and then there is a radical that is left behind. Okay. So once this radical is left behind, you have the you know formation of the it picks up you know in the presence of ethanol it picks up a H dot and produces this olefin. So prior to that we actually have an elimination reaction that occurs and this elimination reaction that occurs has this R1 and R2 trans to one another. So in this Julia olefination, we end up with an olefin that is produced in the following manner. The next reaction we are going to look at is the Peterson reaction. And in the Peterson reaction, the reagents that are used are these silyl hydroxy silyl compounds and the mechanism or the reagents that are used are potassium hydride and THF. And when you take this silyl, you know, two silyl hydroxy aliphatic compound, you end up with an olefin at this position. That is, there's a loss of SiMe3OH. So trimethyl SiMe3OH is actually lost and it gives you an olefin. So the mechanism that we propose for this reaction is as follows. So you have a loss of OH, H plus, that gives you this alkoxide. And now the alkoxide can react with the silyl group. We know that uh, silicon has a very good affinity for oxygen. And so once this happens, when this attack happens, you can imagine that there could be a, you know, a reverse, this carbon sulfur bond is going to break and it may produce an enolate of a sort, I mean a carbanion of a sort and that will then subsequently undergo rearrangement or this carbanion is going to rearrange and kick out SiMe3O-. Alternatively, you can also have a situation where this O- attacks the silicon and then much like the Wittig reaction. So if you remember, the Wittig reaction had exactly the same kind of intermediate where you had a phosphorus instead of silicon. This can be a concerted reaction and give you this product. So normally, when you look at these reactions, the geometry of the product is actually going to be determined very clearly. That is, you don't have a mixture of products that are formed. You normally get a single product or a majority of one product. So therefore, it's likely that the reaction happens in a more concerted fashion. However, we need to understand the possibilities in this reaction. So in this particular reaction, we have two conformations that can undergo elimination. So if you see here, this oxygen and this sulfur are in parallel to one another. You can have a situation where the propyl groups are actually para or actually anti to one another. The second situation is the propyl groups are actually sin to one another. If you consider these two situations, it is likely that the energy or the barrier that one needs to cross for this reaction is going to be higher and therefore this is actually going to be more favored. So you end up getting the trans product 
although you have a choice of doing a trans or cis and the trans product ends up being the major product okay so moving on with our name reactions we'll look at the greenyard reaction so the greenyard reaction is something that you guys have already learned before so when you react an alkyl bromide with magnesium turnings you produce this rmgpr so rmgpr is actually can be synthesized or it gets commercially available of course you need to understand that it's quite explosive so if you expose a little bit of water it's going to you know it's highly exothermic reaction so one of the things that you can do with the greenyard reagent is to react it with a ketone and since we are dealing a lot with carbonyl compounds in the semester you're going to end up with this omgpr and then subsequently reaction of this with water is going to give you this product the next name reaction that we're going to look at is the shapiro reaction now this is an interesting reaction because this reaction involves the formation of a hydrozone i think in the chemistry practicals we have looked at you know functional group analysis and we find that aldehydes or ketones can actually react with 2,4 dinitro phenyl hydrazines to give you the hydrazone and that is one of the ways in which we look for aldehydes or ketones so the formation of this hydrazone is not a new reaction as far as we are concerned now the next step is reaction with this butyl lithium and here is where the mechanism gets interesting we'll look at it shortly but uh, you find here that this carbon c double bond nitrogen n is gone and you generate this organolithium derivative which can then react with an electrophile and we look at various electrophiles here you can add a source of proton and you just get an olefin or you can react an aldehyde to give you product so the mechanism for this uh, shapiro reaction is as follows so you start with uh, this ketone react it with you know toluyl hydrazine this is so2 the phenyl ring uh, and a methyl group at the para position and so this is a, a hydrazine with an electron withdrawing group much like 2,4 dinitro phenyl hydrazine and then uh, i'm not going to go through the mechanism but you generate this hydrazone and now when you react it with uh, butyl lithium this nh is actually quite acidic because it's next to an electron withdrawing group which is the sulfone and so it's going to form n minus and now subsequently you need to look at the arrow pushing here a little carefully you can actually produce the enolate as shown here because this position is also acidic this alpha position is also acidic and now if you push electrons that is the enolate the carbanion goes in and this there's a new bond form between this nitrogen and nitrogen to give you this double bond and subsequently loss of ar so2 minus so ar so2 minus is nothing but ar s double bond o o minus so this is a fairly uh, stable and a good leaving group and you end up with an intermediate like this where there are two nitrogens with a negative charge and of course lithium ion is the counter ion and now if you push electrons you can actually lose nitrogen n triple bond n and so nitrogen is lost from this molecule and you produce this lithium intermediate that we saw and now so therefore if you look at this reaction it is the conversion of a ketone to an olefin based organolithium compound these are very useful intermediates in synthesis because now you can use this and react it with a ketone react it with an aldehyde or do other reactions and you can form carbon carbon bond forming reactions so the shapiro reaction is a very useful way to convert a ketone to the corresponding lithium olefin salt which can subsequently react with electrophiles to give you the product now the last name reaction that we are going to look at is the reimer timon reaction so this is something that you guys have already probably seen in the past it's no harm in revisiting it so you react uh, chloroform and uh, a base with phenol and you get this product so the mechanism is as follows chloroform is quite acidic i know you can reason this out because once the carbanion is formed it's got three electronegative atoms next to it so it's quite stable and now there's an interesting reaction that happens the chloride ion leaves and you leave behind 
a lone pair of electrons and a carbon which is known as a carbene. And now carbene is a quite a reactive group. So this phenolate that is produced over here can react with this carbene and generate this kind of an intermediate with a carbanion here. And then subsequently this aromaticity can be restored and you get this kind of an intermediate 7 where you have CCl2, CH, Cl2 next to the phenol. And now you can imagine that there can be a displacement of one of the chlorides by hydroxide. This will be a SN2 type reaction. And once this is displaced, you have O minus Cl R. So these are excellent intermediates for kicking out chloride. And so they are not quite stable. And so they are going to just kick out chloride and form the aldehyde. So with that, we are done with the name reactions as part of the syllabus. So, you know, some of these reactions are a little complicated, but most of them are fairly straightforward. And as I mentioned, there is no need for you to remember the name of these reactions. It's useful to remember the name, but it's important for you to understand the mechanism of these reactions. And these are very useful moving forward for various chemistry courses that you're planning to take. 